SJC 11674, Commonwealth versus Earl Fulgham and Michael Corbin. Which, on behalf of Mr. Corbin, good morning. Good morning, and I'm here today with my law clerk, Allison Conigliano, who has also been very helpful in working with me on this case. Mr. Corbin should be granted a new trial where the police seized and searched 11 days of personal text messages without probable cause, <clears throat> excuse me, and without a warrant. <clears throat> the police acquired these text messages based upon a 2703 order uh, demanding essentially the contents of all stored communications. And it was the 2703 order was not based upon probable cause, but it was based upon reasonable grounds to believe that the L L <coughs> evidence sought was relevant and material to an ongoing investigation. Excuse me. Now, we have a reasonable expectation of privacy in our personal communications. Even since 1877, in a case involving mail, the contents of the mail is personal and private. And even though we deliver it to a post box, gets carried by various postal people, the contents are sacrosanct. Now, in this particular case, Metro PCS acted as the equivalent of our postmaster. It didn't examine the contents. It didn't analyze what was going on in those contents. It just acted as an intermediary to deliver the contents from person A to person B. <coughs> um, this is quite different from, say, Commonwealth versus Code, in which the defendant authorized someone to take down his messages. In other words, giving it to a third party to look at the contents. Here, there was no agreement that a third party examine those contents. Um, statutory protection is evidence of what societal expectations are in terms of a reasonable expectation of privacy. And Massachusetts, as well as the federal court, the federal stat statutes right. Congress. If, if, you could, if you could take it step by step, uh, my understanding is that your argument is that this is in violation of 2703. And Massachusetts right. Constitution. Right, but, I mean, but, but initially you're saying it's a violation of the federal statute itself. Yes. That requires probable cause yes. for this. Yes, and, and if we do an analysis of the statute, they, this statute was written in the, in the 19, I believe 1980s, the law, technology was way behind what it is today. And the statute distinguished between ECS, or electronic communication services, and RCS, remote computing services, in terms of the degree of protection that it would give communications. Now, if we look at the definition of ECS as a service which provides users the ability to send or receive wire or electronic communications, clearly that is what this is. Um, if we look at the definition of RCS, and if we look more importantly at Congress's intentions with RCS, as in the Senate reports which were cited in my reply brief, it expected an RCS to be something, it, I mean, this was done in the days in which there were, a lot of data was processed off-site, personal computers were not commonplace, and it was a data processing, a data storage feature. So immediate communications were given a lot more protection than the RCS. Now, regardless of whether you consider this RCS or ECS, there was not compliance with the law, but let me do an analysis of both of these. If we look at ECS, if we assume that this is an ECS, the law clearly states that all communications less than 180 days old, which this was, require going through a state subpoena probable cause. That was not done. So if this is viewed as ECS, it is in violation of 2703. Now let's say it, and, and I, I cite also Quan versus Arch Wireless, indicating that 
in terms of at least email, uh, email rather than text messages, that is an ECS, and there are very few cases in the country in which this is discussed, whether it's ECS or RCS. But even assuming that it is RCS first, there was, if you look at the affidavit, the only thing it says in the affidavit is that Mr. Thomas, Mr. Fulgim, Mr. Corbin knew each other and there had been communications back and forth between each other on the day of the murder. That's not the same as saying why they need 11 days of text messages, both before and after. And these are personal, a lot of this is personal private with girlfriends, other entities, why 11 days is necessary. So I argue that it didn't even meet the standard. Now, if we, the, the district attorney is relying on 2703B1B um, to uh, say that we, we were allowed to, to do this because, uh, you know, there's that provision along with um, 2705A allows 90 days, up to 90 days of notice. However, if we look at 2703B2B, and I did not put this provision in my brief, but it's 2703B2B, it indicates that 2703B1B is applicable only if the communication is held solely for the purpose of providing storage or commuter processing to the subscriber or customer. So uh, this, this was, Metro PCS held the data for uh, 60 days before overriding it. There, these were text messages that are sent. This is not email that someone can go and access months later and, and change, um, resend, modify, but this is just a simple text message. So it doesn't even comply with the exception. But even if, even if we say that, well, maybe 2705A would allow for a delayed notification, there has to be a finding by the court and there was none. Now, tucked in this single-spaced, 10-page police affidavit, there was a request that he'd like, the officer would like 90 days. But it was not in the, uh, in the request, in the 2703 request itself, in the body of the request, a request for a delay, and it certainly wasn't in the order. The court did not order a delay of 10 days, 20 days, 90 days. So because there was no request and certainly no order for it, even if we treat this as RCS, the prosecution was not entitled to act to the content of that communication. Now this was far from harmless error. And counsel's failure to make a motion to suppress this uh, one of the things one considers is would, would it likely have succeeded? And if so, what is the effect of that? If we look at the error portion of this, this was the only evidence that indicated a motive. Mr. Corbin owed Mr. <coughs> excuse me, owed the victim, the person who was murdered here, he owed him money and he didn't have enough to pay. And he was going to that person's house that evening to work something out. That was critical. Now, if we, if we look at this, it, it is manifestly unreasonable for counsel not to have filed a motion. Okay, let's, let's assume you get past that. Uh, what do you do with the fingerprint on the curling iron? The fingerprint on the curling arm. This was a partial print, a little over half a print. The Commonwealth expert said, hmm, there are some inconsistencies, uh, incongruities, but I find that it is individualized to Mr. Corbin. The defense expert said, there are these incongruities, didn't use that, those language, and it is not identified to Mr. Corbin. So, Importantly, Mr. Corbin had been in that apartment before. He had been, there was a photo of him sitting there in the apartment. But the, but the cord from the curling iron was used 
to bind the feet of the victim. That is correct. Yet only a partial thumbprint was found on it. Now, it is unlikely that Mr. Corbin would have curled his hair while he was at that apartment. Precisely. But it is quite possible that if a curling iron were sitting on a sink, he might have pushed it aside. So the fact that it is on a curling iron, if it is on an item, and I'd be much more sympathetic if there were more, a handprint or a whole thing, but this is just a tiny partial print. And it is a challenged partial print. And it should never have even come in in the first place, partial print. So even if the partial print came in, it would show... I'm sorry, it should not have come in because of the oh, individualized? Because of what? It should there, not, there it should not have come in because of the characterization? Okay, I'm not sure that you... I, I know that you complained about the testimony that it was individualized to him, but... Oh, there, there was the issue of the 10 print card as well. Oh, I'll see. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. gotcha. The... Um, that was, was substantially challenged. The prosecution, in, the prosecution's fingerprint witness, I individualized his print to a 10 print card. And in Mr. Corbin's case, she didn't even say where she got the 10 print card. Um, but she got a 10 print card somehow. And this 10 print card, and she testified all 10 print cards will contain the signature of the defendant. This 10 print card didn't contain his signature. It didn't contain the date. It didn't contain a photograph. It didn't contain uh, the name of the barracks or the arresting officer or the officer containing the prints. And on that 10 print card, there were spaces that all this information was supposed to be filled out. So essentially it said, here's a guy, here's his weight, here's his height, here's an address, here's an arrest date, but, but none of that was tied into Mr. Corbin. So both, both attorneys objected on grounds of business records and Melendez Diaz. Um, after the 10 print card was admitted, the Commonwealth brought in uh, Trooper Gibbons, but she didn't work in the division in which these records were stored or kept. Uh, she had not even produced the 10 print card that was used to do the individualiz individualization. It came, we don't know where in Mr. Corbin's case. So there was just simply no evidence, no reliable evidence that, that with the source of the fingerprints on Mr. Corbin's card. Now, can, if can we... Can I just uh, ask you, stated more simply, aren't you saying there was no authentication to show that it was a known print? Yeah, that's one of, that's one of the reasons, what's one of the things that was argued. But is that what you were just saying for the last minute? That yes. There's no authentication as to it being yes. a known you know, print? Yes, that's, that, that's one argument on it, yes. And the other argument is, it's not a business... It, it's not a business record. This is not like an employment information. This is someone comes and, and prints, even if, even if we could assume that, that, that this card came from a legitimate source from the, federal, from the uh, police database, the fact that we, we don't, we, this was not, there's no evidence that this is a business record because the person providing the prints didn't have a good faith duty to provide accurate information. I'm not saying it's not a business record. You're saying that there's a second level of hearsay in it because there's no source that, of somebody with a business duty to say this is my print. My argument is that there, I mean, there are multiple, there are multiple arguments listen, here. I'm it's a business record. They, they keep it in its regular course of business to make the record. The record's made in the regular course of business. It's kept in good faith, and it's before the, um, uh, the, the alleged uh, incident. I think what you're saying is that there's an implicit second level of hearsay in the business record because the only source of who it is would be um, somebody saying, I'm Mr. Corbin or I'm Mr. Smith or them having an identification that says that. I would agree with you. And if someone is arrested and they don't have a name, I mean, they don't have ID with them and they're taken to be printed and the prints don't come up as anyone else, those prints are going to be assigned to that individual. Well, that's a reasonable argument, which I'm interested yeah. in hearing, but there's no argument this isn't a business record. Well, the issue is, was it, it, it is in a sense, because it, it's made not for the present records, but it's made for future records. That, that's an argument that it's testimonial. That's not an argument it's a business record. I, I would agree with you there, yes. And in, in, a sense, in a sense, it was testimonial because it was created for future identification not necessarily present. Once you've got the person, once you've identified him, that's that. 
it's a future. Does he have a record? Or can we use this in a trial to show that maybe he, was, uh, he had a record in the past, which is, what this was, um, which is why these records are kept. So I, I would argue that it is not uh, compliant with the law, that there is a Melendez-Diaz issue. Um, counsel didn't even ask for a business record instruction. Counsel didn't object to um, uh, Ms. Tolan, to, and, and, and my co-counsel, I'm sure, will argue this in much more detail because I am running low on time, but there were other issues with this business record. Now, now, if you have, even if you eliminate the text messages of partial print alone in an apartment where he's been in before, it's probably not going to be enough to convict him. But now you challenge the fingerprint. Now you challenge the uh, the the phone record, I mean, the, the, the phone records and, and the identification of the print, Mr. Corbin should be granted a new trial because all of the evidence that came in, to Kim, came in was, was, was certainly questionable and violated his constitutional rights. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning still. Good morning, may it please the court, Elizabeth Caddick for Earl Fulgham. There were two pieces of evidence against uh, Mr. Fulgham that were improperly admitted. One was the cell site location information that was um, produced without probable cause. And the other was, as co-counsel just discussed, the uh, admission in a first degree murder case of fingerprint evidence um, based on a 10 print card that was matched to latent prints from the scene instead of matching Mr. Fulgium's prints um, to, or attempting to match Mr. Fulgium's prints to the latent prints found at the scene. With regard to the first issue, can you talk about what happened with the administrative subpoena, as far as you know? Yes. The uh, administrative subpoena, um, it appears as if at this point there was um, an administrative subpoena that was submitted prior to the 2703 application, uh, and the administrative subpoena was not signed by an assistant district attorney or an assistant attorney general. The, the, the two people who are authorized by case law. I'm sorry, I, I looked at it and I thought it said it was signed by ADA Pappas on behalf of Mr. Zabin. Uh, no, uh, the, uh, the- The August 4th? Yes, the August 4th, yes. We, we had um, noted that there was a dissimilarity in the signatures between the August 17th um, uh, and the August 8th signatures, both purporting to be ADA Pappas, and we were informed by um, the DA's office that the first one, the one that was sent before the 2703, was signed by an administrative assistant not signed by uh, ADA Pappas. Oh, so when it says by ADA John Pappas and says J Pappas, it's not Mr. Pappas's signature. I don't <coughs> see that that's the... Um, I'm looking at, at CA 25 and the red brief, the next to one of the last few pages. I, it's August 4th, 2011. Okay, and, and how do we know, does the Commonwealth concede, I don't know that we have anything in the record, does the Commonwealth concede that that's not Mr. Pappas' signature? Yes. I in, guess we'll find out in a moment from Mr. It, Hillman. Yes, but, in fact okay. it was Mr. Hillman who but conceded you're that. But you're, but you're confident, so basically you're saying that's not Mr. Pappas who signed it. Exactly. And so because uh, case law holds that uh, this, this does not have judicial oversight this administrative subpoena. Uh, there's no judicial oversight, so it can only be submitted by an ADA or an AAG. And in fact, in, in the case of uh, Theodorov, where there had been um, a detective who signed it, it was found that those were not legitimate uh, uh, um, subpoena, administrative subpoenas. Uh, and now, that, 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 the one for August 4th was not for CSLI, I gather. It was just for, for call details. So exactly. it, was, it was toll records and subscriber information. Exactly. Um, but the reason that this is important is, well, well, one, it's prejudicial alone because these records were used 
to argue that the parties were communicating with each other on the day of the crime. But more importantly, this information from these phone call logs were used to try to determine or to create probable cause to obtain the cell site location information via the 2703 application. That was the August 15th application. Exactly. So if you take the information from this uh, um, improper uh, administrative subpoena that came about as a result of this improper administrative subpoena, you take that out from the 2703 application affidavit, um, you certainly have no probable cause to believe that Mr. Fulgium committed the crime, which we know from Augustine 1 is the standard in Massachusetts for obtaining 2703 cell site location information. Probable cause there was a crime committed, which of course we have, and probable cause that the cell site location information will result in uh, evidence against Mr. Fulger. But did the police have that same information from checking the phone of Mr. Thomas? No, there was no um, information that Mr. Fulgium communicated with Mr. Thomas on the day of the crime. There's information that they communicated prior uh, days, multiple times on some days, but they had already spoken to uh, Mr. Fulgium and knew that the two of them were, were friends, were business associates, and that they both um, were in the drug business. Uh, so that's not surprising, um, but the but there was nothing in Thomas's records to show that he had been communicating with Mr. Fulgium on the day of the crime. Uh, now, e even if you were to use the uh, log information from the uh, invalid subpoena, I mean administrative subpoena, there's still not enough probable cause within the 2703 application. And that's because all that is in there is, is pretty much what, what I had just said, is that they knew each other, um, the victim and Mr. Fulgium. They were in the drug business together. Uh, that um, Corbin and Fulgium had communicated on the day of the crime, which, of course, is nothing surprising. Um, and that the additional information is that there had been a stolen phone that was used to communicate um, among the various parties on the, the day of the crime, which is Corbin, Fulgium, and the victim. But your brother says that because there was no objection to that application, that, you're not, that, that you don't fall within the Augustine realm and that you essentially are in the realm simply of whether counsel was ineffective. Well, or simply the same standard would be a, um, a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. You know, we certainly don't have the benefit of, of having um, harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, but even using the standard of a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice because the issue wasn't uh, raised in a motion to suppress, there because the cell site location information was used repeatedly um, through, through graphics, through testimony, to um, attempt to place Mr. Fulgium at the scene of the crime uh, during the time of the crime, uh, certainly the prejudice uh, has created a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. Uh, there, were, there were graphs and, and what was perhaps very um, prejudicial is that the cell site's uh, location was the street behind the victim's house, which somehow gave it an aura of being very impressive evidence, um, and which possibly negated the additional testimony of the Commonwealth's expert, well, the, com the, the Commonwealth's witness, who was the keeper of the records for um, T-Mobile, which stated that the uh, cell phone towers can be one and a half, uh, two up to three miles away, can be used from where someone is, depending on what can interfere. And in fact, there were four different cell towers within a, a mile radius of the victim's 
home, meaning that anyone could have been within that area, not actually been in the house. Um, and but but in, in terms of substantial likelihood, what do we do with the fact that once they had his fingerprints, they would have had probable cause? Well, of course, I argue that they, they didn't have his fingerprints that right, you... Right, but, but right. I mean, at the early well, stage, certainly they thought, I mean, in terms of, I, I know you challenge the use of the card at trial, but that would not really affect the view that there was probable cause based on that. But the fingerprint evidence was not included in the I, I understand trial. that, but okay. it, that came later, and then I guess there was another application, which I guess had nothing to do with this, which was approved for a search warrant. Right. For, but that was not your client's phone, that was a different phone. Yes, that was Mr. Corbin's That was phone. Mr. phone. Mr. Corbin was, a, 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 was seized upon his arrest, that was one of those phones. So that had nothing to do with this. No, and there was nothing from um, a, a search of, of uh, Mr. Fulgium's phone that was used against him, so that wasn't an, an issue. It was just so the cell site location so, information. So there was never a search warrant uh, 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 obtained with regard to your client's no. stuff? No, no, so it wasn't corrected at all. So in your client, uh, unlike uh, Mr. Corbin, his, his, um, his driver information was, I think, in a different person's name. Um, Mr. King, perhaps. Mr. No, well, Mr. Fulgium's phone was in his own name. I know. Oh, okay. I think right. Mr. Corbin's Mr. Corbin. Right, someone else. Mr. Corbin's phone. But on the expectation of, of privacy uh, issue, uh, isn't there some analogy uh, that can be made here that when you're sending information via text, it's similar to when you're making an outgoing call, that you don't have an expectation of privacy as to what you send out into the world? Well, but the issue is an expectation of privacy of where you are every couple of minutes in your life. And in fact, his 11 days worth of cell site location information um, presented, it was something like 3,500 hits over that period of time. And it, it's every couple of minutes the government knew where Mr. Fulgium was over 11 days. And certainly this court has held that that's an, an invasion of privacy and something that society recognizes as a reasonable expectation of privacy. So there was a violation of his expectation of privacy. Um, and not only was there uh, no probable cause for the period at the time of the crime, but certainly there wasn't probable cause for the 11 days of cell site location information. Uh, this case is not like the other cases where this court has found that there was probable cause for uh, obtaining cell site location information. Of course, Augustine uh, found that there was a motive, uh, Augustine, to um, harm the victim. He had uh, used his cousin to set up the victim to come to his house that night. Um, he was his, just his, another witness had uh, noted that at 1 a.m. the night of the victim's disappearance, uh, Augustine, who lived in Boston, was north of Boston, speaking to her around 1 a.m., and the victim's car was found in Revere, north of Forest, Boston, in the wee hours of the morning, about a half hour after he was there. So there was certainly probable cause to believe that the cell site location information um, would lead to evidence that he committed the crime, and the, the 12 days of Augustine, or the two weeks in Augustine, this court found was uh, necessary because the victim's body was found, not found until three weeks later, was found in the river uh, and had been there for a while and the government needed to know whereabouts Augustine would have been near the river at a, at a time when the body uh, may have been uh, dumped there. So this, there's nothing like that in here. Uh, in other um, cases, uh, where there was, um, in Estabrook, uh, where there was the, Estabrook had used the co-defendant's information, and Estabrook, it was clear that there was probable cause to get uh, the cell site location information um, because Estabrook had already told the police that um, he was uh, at Salem Hospital uh, the night of the crime. They got uh, surveillance video showing that Esther Brooks showed up at Salem Hospital about a half hour after the crime wearing clothes, um, 
similar to what the, an assailant had worn. The victim had hit Estabrook over the head with the tea kettle, and Estabrook told the hospital workers, I just got hit over the head with the tea kettle. Certainly probable cause to believe that he committed the crime and to obtain his cell site location information. Um, and then um, there was the, the case that the um, Mass Appeals Court uh, had determined, and that had to do with uh, the burning of a, a car, um, where there was information that uh, the phone owner had bought gas with, with about a half mile from where the burning car was using his credit card when, in fact, it was in another state than where he lived, and it was at about 3 o'clock in the morning. So there was probable cause to believe he committed the crime and the cell site information would would locate him. There's nothing like that in this case. There's just no probable cause, as I said, for either the time of the crime, but certainly not for um, the 11 days that they did obtain. And the, the, um, the court um, understands the argument from co-counsel about how the business record exception is not so much that it's, it is or is not a business record, it's that the confrontation right exception to the business records is not applicable, was not applicable in this case, and particularly in a first degree murder case. Now, I, I gather that factually with regard to that issue, you're in the same shoes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hillman, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Zachary Hillman on behalf of the Commonwealth. With me this morning is Assistant District Attorney John Pappas, who is the trial prosecutor in this case. I'd also like to acknowledge the families of the victims who are present in court today. Um, just to clear up a procedural issue right at the outset, um, the administrative subpoena that was issued on August 4th was issued under the authorization of Assistant District Attorney John Pappas. It was signed by an administrative assistant under his authorization and at his request for um, those records. Is, is that good enough? That's, that's fine, Your Honor. Under Fedorov and under the plain wording of the statute, a signature, the actual signature of um, the person, uh, person authorizing it isn't required. It's the authorization that matters, and that's what happened here. Okay, but how did the judge know that? Well, Your Honor, it has, it is oh, signed, sorry. John, it's signed. it is it's signed John Pappas. Right, signed John Pappas. John Pappas didn't sign it. Well, it's signed under his authorization, and that's part of the record. Um, it is part of the record? Where in the record do yes, we sign Yes, Your Honor, that? page uh, 21 of the Commonwealth's Appendix, uh, paragraph 6. And again, under the, the, the plain wording of the statute, and even under Fedorov, what's required is the authorization of the assistant district attorney. And that's what happened here. Turning to the CSLI for Mr. Fulgham, um, as the court noted, we're in a substantial likelihood um, posture because although this case was pending at the time that Augustine was issued, the defendants, the, Mr. Fulgham here never moved to suppress his CSLI. Um, at the time that they, police officers, applied for the order, um, the affidavit in support set out the requisite standard, I would argue it even set out probable cause to obtain the CSLI for Mr. Ful Mr. Fulgham. Um, the, as set out by the, in the affidavit, the police knew at the very outset of the crime that this was a drug robbery. They knew that based on their experience and training, cell phones are often used to set up drug deals. They knew that um, the, whoever committed this crime was known to the victims, and they knew that because, and they could infer that because there was no signs of forced entry here. And they knew that at least two people were involved, given the state of the apartment when the police showed up and went in, but also given that two firearms were found immediately outside the um, apartment building. With that information, they also learned of the stolen Roberto Cruz cell phone. Now this phone is, is, is a critical piece of evidence because it's the tool that the 
investigators could reasonably infer was used to set up and orchestrate this crime. The phone was stolen that afternoon, and it's reasonable to infer that whoever stole that phone had a limited opportunity to use it, basically that night. Um, why would a person steal a phone to set up a drug deal? Well, it was reasonable to infer that they did so in order to cover their tracks um, so that their personal number wasn't the last number that was in contact with Mr. Thomas. In fact, that stolen cell phone was in communication both um, by calls and by text messages on that evening. There was an ongoing text communication between- sorry, with whom, with, 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 with Thomas? I'm sorry, Your Honor, with, with Mr. Thomas. Between 11.05 and 11.32, there was an ongoing text communication between the Cruz phone and Mr. Thomas. 11.32 is the last time that Mr. Thomas's phone is used, which is shortly before the homicide. Now, while the stolen Cruz phone is communicating with Mr. Thomas, it's also communicating with Mr. Fulgham. Mr. Fulgham has a phone call with the stolen <coughs> cell phone at 11.09. He then, Mr. Fulgham, contacts um, James Boyd, or a number registered to James Boyd, and then three numbers, uh, three, contacts three times a number registered to Jaron Brown. He then immediately contacts back the cruise, the stolen cruise phone at 11.37, which is, again, immediately before this crime takes place. It's reasonable to infer, given that Mr. Fulgham knew Mr. Thomas, and it's reasonable to infer that because more than at least, at least two people, as I say, but likely more, was involved in this homicide, and because there's no reason for Mr. Fulgham to be in contact with that stolen phone that evening, reasonable to believe that he had some role in the crime that took place that night, and the CSLI was incredibly important because police knew that Mr. Fulgham was on his phone at and around the time of the homicide. Based on all of those facts, I would suggest to the court that not only was there the standard for 2703D met, but also the probable cause, it was probable cause, had a warrant needed to be issued. Now, let's assume for the sake of argument that you don't prevail in showing that there was probable cause. What, is, what does substantial likelihood mean in this context? Mean to what? Sust substantial likelihood. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Oh, you don't, I'm sorry. Well, part of, the, part of the problem of the posture that we're in right now, um, where there's no motion to suppress that was filed, there is no evidentiary, well, there's no motion to suppress that was filed, and there's no motion for new trial that was filed, and therefore no evidentiary hearing. I would suggest to the court that had these detectives needed to draft an affidavit in support of a search warrant, and therefore needed to establish probable cause, we would have asked the judge at a motion for new trial hearing to take evidence. What did they know? What did they leave out? What would they have included had they known that they needed to get a warrant? Um, Part, and that's part of the problem with the posture that we're in right now. As I said, I don't think the court needs to get to that question because there was probable cause as set out um, in the affidavit had this been in support, uh, submitted in support of a search warrant. I, I would analogize it to um, a situation where, say police learn that a stolen car may have been involved in a crime. Uh, perhaps a drive-by shooting. And say police learn post-shooting that the, there was a, a fingerprint on the passenger side dashboard that came back to John Smith. And suppose they learn that whoever's car had been stolen um, had, didn't know John Smith and had never authorized John Smith to be in their car. Well, the police at that point would have probable cause to believe that John Smith fingerprint having been in an item that was used in the commission of the crime was related such that his CSLI might be relevant to the investigation of that crime. I would analogize it to the situation here, given that the stolen phone was a tool that was used to set up and in the commission of this crime. Okay, but I mean, certainly I understand that if you can, if, if we find that there was probable cause, then that's easy. 
the harder part is if we don't find that there's probable cause. And the argument you essentially just gave earlier is that, well, if we had, if they had moved and we would have had to go to a judge and done an affidavit, we would have included more. But where, if a judge is writing this decision and wants to agree with you, where, is, where in the record is a judge going to look to find what additional information you had at that time that you would have included or that was available but not included because you thought you only needed reasonable grounds? The police learned on July 29th that a thumbprint had been individualized on the magazine of the murder weapon to Mr. Folger. That was not include that fact in the but July 29th they had that even though it was not included in the uh, in the August 15th that's correct your honor um, because and how, they do, we, how they do we know that do we have the report in the record it is it is in the record it's at pages hold on just one moment your honor it's at page 116 to 121 at volume 6 and this is the fingerprint of full Jim that's correct your on honor. the gun that's correct, Your Honor. In fact, that's how they eventually end up IDing Mr. Fulgham and Mr. Corbin once they receive that fingerprint. Now, the police detectives didn't include that fact in the affidavit because they didn't have to at the time that they filed this 2703D order, a request for a 2703D order. Um, and I can assure the court that had the standard been different, had they been required to go get a search warrant, that was a fact that they would have included. And that's what we would be arguing to a judge at a motion for new trial hearing. Okay, can you turn to the Corbin text messages? Yes, Your Honor. So it, it, it's important at the outset to note that Mr. Corbin used all of his cell information in his defense at trial. He introduced his own CSLI records. He went through his text messages, not only with the keeper of the records from Metro PCS, but with Sergeant Daly, and he cited them line by line in his closing argument. His defense was Mr. Thomas was a big, big time drug dealer, and he had lots of people that knew that. He had lots of money in his apartment, and therefore there are lots of people who would want to commit this crime. And he used the text messages for that purpose, going back, so even going back days before the homicide, to point to make that point to the so jury. Because may, maybe maybe that just rolls in. Let's do the best we can with it, as opposed to preferring that there not be text messages. Well, the problem, Your Honor, is we're here on direct appeal. There was no motion for new trial filed, and there's no affidavit from Attorney Miller, so we don't really know what he's thinking. What we can glean from the record is that he used these strategically um, to his benefit in his defense at trial. And again, where he's trying to establish that Mr. Thomas was a drug dealer who had lots of money, who had people that would want to commit this crime. So, so how do the text messages prove that? The text, I'm a little confused. The text messages prove that because they prove that Mr. Thomas was the person who was supplying the drugs to Mr. Corbin for sale. So they, they go, as Mr. Miller argued to the jury, they go to show that Mr. Thomas is the main man. Well, they also go to the fact that, I gather, Thomas basically says, I need money because I've got to pay money to some other guys who want it from me, and you owe me money, and I really need it now because they're demanding it. Uh, agreed, Your Honor. And, and I think this is a case where um, the records were useful to, to both parties. Both the Commonwealth sought to use them, as did Mr. Miller. Now, even if the court, even if the, there were not a strategic basis for Mr. Miller to use these, had he filed a motion from trial, would not have been successful. I've made the argument in my brief as to why and how the police properly obtained these text messages pursuant to 2703. I'm happy to, to discuss that with the court, but at the end of the day, suppression and exclusion of this evidence isn't a remedy for a violation of 2703. Well, let's, let's, let's go to that a little bit. Yes. Uh, Metro PCS says we only hold it for 60 days. That's correct. 
to get to 20, to get to section B, you need it to be held for 180 days. I disagree, Your Honor. The 180 day requirement only applies to 27, to, to those records that are held in electronic storage under 2703A. Under 2703B, you can obtain the records with administrative subpoena, regardless of the 180 day rule, if it's held in remote computing service. Okay, and now the, uh, We'll grant you that for now, but the statute also says this does not supersede state law, which is more demanding. And why should our state law permit the content of text messages to be procured by the Commonwealth without probable cause, where I think there's even a statute which speaks to it, does it not? Yes, Your Honor. A couple points. There is... Um, at this point, um, and at the point that the text messages were requested pursuant to 2703, um, there was, uh, the, the third party doctrine was alive and well, with the exclusion of CSLI as laid out in Augustine. Now, I grant the court that in, I think it's footnote 35, this court noted that given technological advances, there might be reason to modify uh, the third party doctrine as it pertains to electronic content. This isn't the case to make that decision or to ask that question because at the very outset, the defendant has wholly failed to show that he has an expectation of privacy in the content of these text messages, nor did he show that he had standing to challenge it. Right well, at the but, but let's stop you there. You're saying they're his. Commonwealth saying that he was using Troy King's phone, the 2703 application doesn't even mention the name of Troy King, it just describes it as Corbin's cell phone. Agreed, but he still bears the burden of establishing that he had an expectation of privacy in the data that's held by that third I understand, party. but don't you get to the same issue we have with regard to standing for possessory crimes, that when the Commonwealth claims you possessed it, it puts somebody in the strange position, the same position for a possessory crime, for a defendant to say, I, that's my cell phone. So in order to, so you're saying he would have to say that's my cell phone in order to get it when the Not Commonwealth has already said that's the cell phone that I was, that he was using, that's his, that's effectively his cell phone? Well, I th not, not just my cell phone, that's, m I have a, a possessory interest in the data that's held by a third party, but the defendant um, may put the Commonwealth to the burden of showing that that phone was in fact his. So he does have a burden to show that the, the records, if he's going to challenge the obtaining of that data, he has a burden to show that he has a possessory interest in that data. Even but if, but he, if it's even truly if Troy, King's, Troy King's phone and Troy King's data, then it's irrelevant. I'm sorry, Your Honor, would you repeat if that, it's, please? If it's truly tr Troy King's data, then it's irrelevant. Well, he would still have to show that he has an expectation of privacy in that cell phone, which he didn't do here. There has been no affidavit filed that said I have an expectation of privacy in the data that's held by a third party. Well, we have a lot of these cases. It may not be Troy King, but it's I use my girlfriend's cell phone. I use my mother's cell phone, my niece, because I have no credit record myself. And all these cases? No, I'm not. Standing? I'm not suggesting that at all. What I'm suggesting is in this case where the evidence shows that the defendant registered the name in a fictitious name. Um, that is insufficient to show that he has standing or an expectation, a subjective expectation of privacy in those records. In footnote six in Augustine, this court specifically distinguished the situation where the phone was obtained by the girlfriend or the mother um, and was used by the defendant with a situation where a defendant secures a phone in the fict or a subscriber, um, a, an account in a fictitious name. And that's what we have here on this record. There's been no evidence presented by Mr. Corbin that the phone was used or, or, or was uh, subscribed to f by, a, by a girlfriend or a but relative. But you can't have it both ways. I mean, y you say that you need to get it because it's his, and then you're saying he doesn't have standing because it's in somebody else's name. Those are contradictory positions. No, Your Honor, I disagree. We have a burden in, to show and link that phone to Mr. Corbin, which we did at trial. But if he wants to challenge that, challenge this, the, the seizure of that data, it's his burden to file an affidavit that says, 
I, I, I understand, but what I'm asking is if you have taken the position that it's his phone in your 2703 affidavit, why does he have to then prove that it's his phone, that he has a, 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 an interest, a privacy interest in the phone? You've already done that. Because he, he, he may, he can't challenge the seizure of data that belongs to someone else. And if he, down the road at trial, were to argue that the Commonwealth failed to meet its burden of linking that phone to him, then he could do that. But he still has a burden in litigating a motion to suppress to establish that he has an expectation of privacy in those records and that they're not records of someone else, which he's wholly failed to do here um, by not failing, filing an affidavit, not presenting evidence, any evidence whatsoever, that the phone and the data that was held by that third party was his. The record only shows that it was registered in a fictitious name. Obje and objectively speaking, if we were to look at the expectation of privacy from an objective standpoint, again, part of the, of the problem in the posture that we're in, um, litigating this case on direct appeal, is that not only has the defendant presented no evidence at a motion to suppress or at a motion for new trial, establishing that the phone was his or that he had an expectation of privacy in those records, the Commonwealth was not able to introduce evidence of the privacy policy that was in effect at the time that Troy King registered the account. I've noted in my brief that the privacy policy of Metro PCS as of the time of the filing of the brief would preclude him from arguing that this is an expectation of privacy that society would recognize as reasonable. Do you really want to go there with well, regard to emails too? And I mean, who knows what, when you sign up for Verizon or Google and you sign something, you prepare to sign away your rights to give the government access to obtain all of your personal emails, all of your personal texts, simply pursuant to 2703 without any finding a probable cause because there's small print that said we retain the right to use this ourselves? Again, Your Honor, we're looking at this, this solely this case. There are... Dan, but I mean, you're asking us to establish this notion that if it's, if the provider of, says basically we have access to your texts in contrast to, I guess, T-Mobile, which doesn't keep texts, that that changes everything with regard to the ability of the government to obtain all of an individual's text, which these days, I gather, constitutes the majority of all communications with other human beings. Uh, I mean, that's a big deal. And again, I'm not asking for a blanket rule at all. What I'm saying is, on the facts of this case, this case is closely analogous to the Cote case, in which this court held that the third party doctrine did not preclude the, com or did not allow the defendant to establish an expectation of privacy in the contents of the records in Cote. Can I, can I just make sure I understand your yes, argument Your Honor. on this? Are you making the narrow argument that if there had been a motion to suppress file, that the defendant would have had um, the uh, burden of showing an expectation of privacy, and in the narrow circumstances where somebody uses a fictitious name, the crucible of litigation at the trial level would have addressed the issue of whether or not you're signing everything away, giving up your expectation of privacy when you use a false name. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I think that's okay. part of it, yes. Yes. Could could you? Uh, I don't want your time to yes, fritter Honor. away without talking about this fingerprint issue, yes, which Honor. is of concern. I'd like to know why the Commonwealth didn't use the prints from the arrest. Don't they usually do that? The, these were prints from the arrest. The, not the arrest for this crime, um, and at least as far as Mr. Fulgham goes, he was not printed after this crime because he was already in custody. That's part of the reason that we didn't bring before the jury, um, one, why he wasn't fingerprinted at the time of 
why they didn't have fingerprints from, the t from his arrest in this crime, but also why when Ms. Tolan was establishing and, and explaining what a, finger, a known print is and what a print card is, she didn't say that um, the state police or Boston police get the fingerprints always in the case of an arrest. Now, Judge, L Gaz I mean, excuse me, Judge Laureate knew that um, as the gatekeeper allowing this evidence in because we explained that to him and he saw the fingerprint cards. But I would direct the court's attention to volume eight, pages 194 to 95, and page 59 of uh, volume nine. And then there's a discussion at the beginning of volume nine about these fingerprint cards. At those pages that I just cited to the court, Ms. Tolan explains, as I just said, she explains what a known print is, she explains what a, f a, car a print card is, um, who, who maintains these print cards and where she would get them in using her analysis. Then Trooper Gibbons comes in and she testifies as a state trooper and as a former keeper of the records that the print cards that were introduced to Ms. Tolan were properly kept in the ordinary course of business in good faith. But how so, do you get around the fact that it could, could be that somebody lied about who, who they were? Yes, Your Honor. Johnson versus Lutz, which is the case that both my sisters cite to with respect to uh, business records that rely on the second or totem pole hearsay of a person, says specifically, the purpose of the business records rule, and I, I'm sorry to read to the court, but I think this is more accurate. Purpose of the business records rule is to permit a writing or record made in the or ordinary course, a regular course of business, to be received in evidence without the necessity of calling as witnesses all of the persons who had any part in making it, provided the record was made on information imparted by persons who were under a duty to impart such information. There is a duty upon a person who is being fingerprinted after an arrest to give accurate information. Not a business duty. That's the whole point of Johnson, Johnson versus Lutz. The person at the scene of the crime might have a civic duty to, to report something, or a civic duty to report it accurately, the police are not saying anything. That's not the point of Johnson versus Lutz. The point is that you have a business duty of that business. The person coming in and being fingerprinted doesn't have a business duty of the police department. That's the problem. Well, I think they, I, I would analogize it, to, analogize it to, to Lutz and to Beale Bank because the question is, does the person who's providing the preparer of the document have a duty to provide truthful information? But I think Beal Bank is different. Beal Bank, if, if one agrees with the holding of Beal Bank, is saying that basically the judicial notice or by agency that the, that the one servicing the bank is the same as the bank. There's no way the person providing the fingerprint is the same as the police department. There is absolutely, no, what, what protects against the infirmities of hearsay when you're dealing with the business records exception is that that particular person providing the information has a business duty of that business to do so. The person saying, I am John Smith, has absolutely no business duty of the police department to say, I am John Smith. Just like in Johnson versus Lutz, the person didn't have a business duty to uh, uh, provide the information to the police department. There's just a second level of hearsay that was satisfied. Well, I think the real inquiry with respect to the business records is, is not just a business duty within the business, but the, a duty to provide truthful information. And I think that's really the crux of it, is a duty of the person who's giving information to the preparer of the business record, accurate and reliable information. But that means that we just sort of have to tear up the business records exception because um, uh, that, that says that, it, well, if inside a business record and someone outside the business had a duty to provide it, then the business records exception anoints everything that's in it with some sort of uh, fragrant oil. I disagree, Your Honor. I, I think there is a safety valve here. If we look at the cases um, uh, that were cited by my sister, so one is a, a hotel registrant. There's no duty on a hotel registrant to provide an accurate identification to the, to the hotel. Um, person sending money via Western Union. There's no duty on the person to 
provide an accurate identification to Western Union in sending the money. Even the Kelly case that's out of the Mass Appeals Court, that case dealt with an unidentified individual providing information to the police. Here, a person who's been arrested has a duty, a legal duty, to provide accurate information, ac accurate biographical information to the police. Otherwise, they're subject to criminal, uh, to, to criminal prosecution. And so that's the, duty that that's the duty that ensures that the information that's provided to the preparer of the document can rely on in, in making their business record. As I point out my- One case that stands for that proposition ever, the business duty is the duty of somebody within the business. Anyone outside the business that's gonna get into the record, that's gonna be appropriately inside the record, they need to have a second level of hearsay that satisfies that. Well, again, I, I, I analogize the situation to Beale Bank, and I know that Your Honor is making the business distinction, but I think the rule that is, is really underpinning the business records exception is the duty. And there are cases, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, I'm, I'm happy to provide a 16 a letter to the court, but there are duty, there, there, there are cases, excuse me, that have said that police reports um, are, can qualify as business records, and there's Commonwealth versus Burton, which is a case out of the appeals court. This is a business record. The, 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 these cards are business records. They're absolutely business records. There's no doubt about it. It's whether the second level of hearsay satisfies an exception to the business record and it, it's appropriately stuck in the record. Now it's appropriately stuck in the record because it's a business duty of the police officer to record the information, but the, biz, but the duty of the person providing the name is not a duty of the police department. But it's a duty of the individual providing- One case ever that has stood for that proposition. So what do the police do to verify that they are taking a print from the person who says, I'm John Smith. I don't know what the transcript, what the testimony was in this case. Was there any testimony intended to uh, enhance the reliability of the information on the card? Well, the information, the biographical information on the card um, certainly matches the biographical information of the individuals. And, and by that I mean, height, weight, um, that sort of biographical information. The, we didn't get into, um, we didn't get into how the information was taken because we didn't want to introduce prejudicial evidence that the fingerprints had been taken at the time of arrest. Was that an agreement between counsel? Well, that's, no, no, but that is, not as I recall, but that's certainly a, a concern that we expressed to the judge um, on the, the morning of the ninth day of trial um, when we're talking about this issue. That's a completely reasonable concern. So th th was there a stipulation of not putting that in or some sort of implicit agreement? I, I can't recall. There's nothing in the record. Um, I can't recall if that was uh, an explicit um, off-the-record agreement between the parties. But, um, but, but the exhibit itself, I'm looking to Mr. Fulgiums, I don't have before me Mr. Corbin's, says date of arrest July 18th, 2011, which was seven days before the shooting. Yes, that's correct. So the jury did see that he indeed had been arrested before the shooting. That may be the case, Your Honor. Um, maybe it, uh, it may have been that we intended to redact that out and it just escaped our escaped our view. Um, and, I would, and, and in terms of the ordinary course of business, the form says signature of person fingerprinted, nothing there. Signature of off official taking fingerprints, says Robert Newton, no signature. Date, no date. Uh, any evidence that this was the ordinary course to omit required, what appears, social security number, no social security number. Anything that this is the ordinary course to omit this information which appears to be required by the form? Yes, um, Tol uh, Ms. Tolan did testify that signatures aren't always included um, and we did call in the keeper of the records from the state police, Ms. Gibbons, who testified that she reviewed this card. She said this is a card that's kept in the ordinary course of business and all of those factors are factors that will go to the weight of the evidence, not as to its admissibility. 
Thank you. We'll take our morning break.